Hey guys, Coach Daniel Hammer Tennis, and I'd like to welcome you to the Hammer Tennis Classroom. And so inside the classroom is where we get a chance to learn about some of the fundamental concepts that make up your tennis game. And so a lot of times I find that players who are trying to reach higher levels, they don't quite understand some of these fundamental concepts. And that's keeping them from breaking through to those upper levels. And so making sure that you have a just a deep understanding of these fundamental concepts is the key to getting better and improving your tennis game. And so today's concept, we're going to look at spin. And specifically, we're going to look at top spin. Why we use top spin, how it's created, and how you can better understand how to create top spin and when to use it. And so let's get to it. All right, so let's head down to the courts here and let's watch our match between Dan, who's looking pretty happy, and Joe, who's looking like he's not so happy. And let's see what's going on. So every time Joe is hitting the ball, he knows that, well, there's a net and it's in the middle of the court. And so I've got to hit the ball up over the net. So he swings and he's hitting the ball and he's hitting the ball up. But when he hits the ball up, it's crossing the net and then it's falling long. So Joe's starting to get, he's starting to get frustrated. So he thinks, okay, well, I know what I'll do. I just need to slow it down. And we hear this so much. A lot of coaches will tell, just slow it down. Hitting the ball long, hitting the ball out all the time. We'll just slow it down. So he says, okay, I'll slow it down. And then the ball goes in the net. Well, he slowed it down too much. So he's like, okay, let me try medium. So now Joe hits the ball and it does something like this. It lands right in the middle of the court. And then Dan, he's driving the ball and it's dropping at the end of the shot, kicking up high. And he's crushing the ball and putting it away. See, because the other thing that's happening is as Dan's hitting his shots, his shot. His shot looks more like this, crosses the net, and then dies down at the end. And then that's kicking up, and that's giving Joe all kinds of problems too. So the next thing Joe thinks is, well, I guess I need to hit maybe more topspin. I've heard about this topspin, hit some topspin. So I guess if I brush up the ball, then that will make topspin. But what happens is, is he brushes up too much, and the ball just rolls out again and drops in the net. And so, I'm sure the story of Dan and Joe sounds familiar to a lot of players, and I use it to kind of exaggerate the point that if you're not using top spin, what's happening is you're hitting a shot, and because you're not giving it a whole lot of spin, it's following a natural parabola shape. And so if it reaches its high point somewhere on your opponent's side of the net, then that means that the ball is going to drop past the baseline. But when you use top spin, because top spin makes the ball go down. So top spin top spin makes the ball go down because what happens is as the ball is spinning, irregularities of the ball react with the oncoming air. And so as the ball flies further through the air, pressure literally pushes the ball down. And so as the ball's flying, the pressure builds, 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 and then the ball drops. So the ball is dropping more on our opponent's side of the net, which is convenient because we can hit the ball up, then it drops down. And so topspin is a significant force on the ball. It's not just gravity that's pulling the ball in. In fact, at Hammer Tennis, that's what we call players who don't use topspin to advance. We call them gravity players. So the only thing pulling their shot down is gravity. And a lot of times they hit the ball with an open face. They hit it with a little spin. The ball flies up. Gravity's pulling it down. Well, gravity is too slow. And so as a result, because gravity is so slow, you have to hit the ball slow. And so you're putting a speed limit on your shot. So the ball's going up in the air, and the only thing bringing it down is gravity. You have to wait for that to happen, so you have to hit your shots about 20, 30 miles an hour. And, or you're hitting the ball really, really low. Because you have to hit it so close to the earth that gravity can pull your shot in. So you're just barely hitting it over the net. And then what happens is your margin of error, again, 
is very low, you're clipping the net, or you're hitting the ball too hard and it's going out again. So you play this constant battle of hitting the ball long, hitting the ball in the net, trying to slow it down, trying to add spin, and your shot's all over the place. Well, let's look at how, now that you know why you need to use topspin, because topspin is going to make the ball dive into the court, so it allows us to hit the ball up first, then it's going to dive into the court. And the other thing topspin does is it stabilizes the ball's flight. So when an object is spinning, the ball becomes more stable in the air. And so as a result of being more stable, it gives us a more consistent flight that we can then aim more consistently because we know how the ball is going to travel through the air. So a spinning object is more stable in its flight. Just think about like a football. So when you throw a spiral, it's much easier to aim a spiral than a ball that's going all which way. And so top spin is going to make the ball dive down. So we hit the ball up, it dives down. It also kicks off the court, which, makes its, which is kind of a secondary benefit. It's convenient because it kicks up into our opponent and it's hard for them to return that high kicking ball. But really, the biggest benefit of topspin is that it pushes the ball down into the courts, which means we can hit the ball up. And the more we can hit the ball up, the more shots we keep out of the net. And the more we can hit the ball up with topspin, the harder we can hit the ball because topspin is driving the ball down. And then it also makes the ball more stable in flight. That way you can aim your shot more consistently. So now that you know why you need to use topspin, let's see how we can be more like Dan, less like Joe, and let's learn how is topspin actually created. All right, so how is topspin created? So there's a lot of things out there that you've probably heard on how to create topspin. You think this is not that difficult, coach. All I gotta do is brush the ball, or maybe roll the ball. And we think that it's the friction between the strings and the ball that create spin. And so I've heard this so many times that the, the string needs to be textured. It needs to have some sort of frictional property to spin the ball. And it catches the ball and it spins it. But however, in reality, there's only one way to create rotation on any object in the entire universe. And it's the same, no matter if it's a ball or a sphere or a square or a rectangle, no matter what the object is, there's one way to create rotation, and that is if we strike the object off its center of mass. And so every object has a center of mass. And if we hit the object directly in line, so if our, the path of the object that's moving lines up with the center of mass, the object will move with no rotation. So Whenever you're brushing, what's happening is, is if your racket is going up at a severe angle like this, the center of mass of the ball is right in the center because it's a sphere. So if we strike somewhere here and our racket's going upward, then the ball's going to rotate. And so we think, well, it's that friction, but it not, has nothing to do with the friction. The friction will help maybe adhere the strike, but it's because the strike is happening off the center of mass. So I could also strike this ball here and the ball is going to rotate forward. That's also going to give me top spin. And so this is a key concept to understand. If you don't understand this fundamental principle, you're going to struggle with creating spin. You're going to think that it requires an upward brush or an upward frictional motion. And that is simply not how rotation is created. So if my racket is traveling upward and the face of my racket is perpendicular to the path of the swing and it strikes right here, this ball will move in this direction with little to no rotation. And it will have, a lot of times it will have a little bit of rotation because it's very difficult to hit it directly square with your face right on the center of mass. But for the most part, it's going to have little to no rotation. However, if I were to swing upward the same exact path, but now my face is at an angle to my path, it's going to make contact with this ball around here first, which again is going to make the ball rotate down. So I've seen some videos and I've heard coaches talk and they said, well, 
I don't intentionally try to create spin. I let my swing do the spin by letting my arm go up and because the racket is traveling upward, that again is how it's making spin. Which again, it doesn't matter if your racket is going up or not. You can create significant amounts of top spin if your racket was swinging completely what we'll say flat or parallel to the ground. If your racket contacts this ball and your face is at an angle and it contacts it here, that ball will spin forward. It has to. So one concept that we teach at Hammer Tennis is that if my racket travels and hits this ball with a square face and my racket is traveling completely square into this ball. If my racket is completely perpendicular to my swing path, when it contacts the center of mass, that ball all will have no rotation and all of the energy, this is what we call direct energy transfer. And so 100% of the energy is going directly into the ball, and so that ball is going that way. So we call that direct energy transfer. However, if our racket was traveling so if our racket was traveling say here, and say the face, which this isn't quite possible, we're just talking about a concept here. If the face were completely parallel with the ground or parallel with the racket path and somehow were to strike the ball without framing it, we'll say, strike the ball there, all of that energy would be transferred into rotation. And so what we call this then is rotational energy transfer. So if hitting the ball with your face, and we're going to call this zero degrees, if hitting the ball with a zero degree face gives you all rotation, and we're going to call this face angle 90 degrees. If hitting the ball with a face of 90 degrees gives you all direct energy and no rotation, what angle could we use to hit this ball to give us a good mixture of rotational energy and direct energy, or a good combination of spin and pace? And that angle is about a 45 degree angle. So if I swing my racket and my face is at a 45 degree angle to the path of my racket, when it contacts this ball, if I'm swinging this way, it's going to contact the ball slightly above the center of mass. The ball is going to rotate forward and it's going to have some pretty good pace. And so the thing to look at too is if you look at most of the players on tour, I've heard so many pros look at high speed footage and they say that the racket face is maybe slightly closed or somewhat neutral as it's striking the ball. But what they're not considering and what they are failing to miss is that they're talking about the ground. It doesn't matter how the face is in relationship to the ground. What it matters is what the face is in relationship to the swing path and the contact point of the ball. It, the ball is a sphere, so where you strike it matters. Not in relationship to the ground, but in relationship to its center of mass. 
whatever this face angle is in relationship to the court is completely irrelevant. So if I'm swinging this way, then the angle is not quite 45, it's almost 90 again. And that's going to give you considerably more pace. If the swing path with this face is like this, low to high, now I've reached about a 45 degree angle, which if you look and track the swing path of most tour players, when the swing path is up, the face is about all at a 45 degree angle. So when they're contacting the ball, the racket face is actually about a 45 degree angle in relation to the swing path, not to the ground. So when they're hitting the ball, it's about a 45 degree angle to the swing path, which means that they're striking the ball slightly above the center of mass, which gives them spin and pace, which is why a touring professional hits the ball with a high degree of pace and spin. So when I watch a lot of amateur players and junior players, I see swing paths that are nearly straight up because they're trying to windshield wiper. They're trying to wiper the ball. So their swing path is nearly straight up. And they're hitting almost the back of the ball, but the problem is, is because the face is also this, what they, almost, what they what again want to call neutral or slightly close to the ground, but it's parallel with the swing path. It's just, and so when they're hitting this ball, they're not getting any direct energy into the shot. All they're getting is rotational energy. The ball spins out, it falls into the net, or it's a very loopy shot into the court that just sits up, and then a player who knows how to drive through the ball and apply contact to just the top above center of mass, they're driving the ball and penetrating the court, and they're hitting winners left and right on these players. I see this all the time. So, what do you need to understand? You need to understand that where you contact the ball in relation to its center of mass is going to directly affect how much pace and spin are on the ball. And so, if you're swinging at a relatively, just say normal, upward path, you need to contact the ball just slightly above the equator, and that's at, in relationship to the ground. You need to strike the ball slightly above the equator, and that's going to make the ball roll forward. And if your face is at about a 45 degree angle to your swing path, you're going to get a good mixture of pace and spin. And ironically, if we look in the golf world, most players can hit their pitching wedge, 9 iron, 8 iron to 7 iron pretty well. And depending on what manufacturer is, those degrees range but you're going to be somewhere between a 40 degree club and about a 48 degree club. And so again, those clubs give players a good mixture of ball speed and spin. And so that's why it's so much easier to control. The clubs that give players just more direct energy into the ball and less spin, a lot of times it's harder for them to control those shots. And then even the wedges a lot of times, again, it's harder for them to control those shots, the distance on it. But those clubs that give a good mixture of direct energy and rotational energy are a lot easier to control. So when you're out there playing, try to hit the ball with about a 45 degree angle face, which is going to be just slightly above, and swing through the ball. And so as you come through the ball, you're going to contact the ball and keep on going through racket, extend to your target. And as you do that, that ball is going to have a good mixture of spin and pace. All right, so now that you understand how where you hit the ball depend, changes the amount of spin and pace onto the shot, and you understand that you shouldn't hit every shot the same way. And so I see players, when they have a short ball, say here, they're trying to brush up on that the same way that they would back at the baseline. They're hitting the same type of shot. They're trying to make contact on the ball in the same place. Well, what happens is if your target, say my target's here, if I'm hitting this shot, and I'm swinging up like this, and I'm contacting the ball in the back, it's just going to kind of spin out. I'm not going to be able to penetrate the court. So what I have to do is I have to change my swing path depending on 
where I am in the court and where the ball is and where my target is. So say for instance, I have this shot here, I'm going to drive through the ball, so I'm going to change my swing path to be more level, so that way I can contact, again, the ball just slightly above the equator, get a good drive. If I'm back at the baseline and I need to hit the ball higher in the air, I may change my swing path to be more steep. Now I'm going to hit the ball what may appear to be slightly below the equator of the ball in relationship to the ground. However, that ball's still going to have a lot of top spin, but now the trajectory of the ball is going to be much higher. So as you're hitting shots from different positions on the court, your contact on the ball is going to change. You're not going to hit the ball on the same spot every time. It just depends on where the ball is and where your target is. And so as you understand and start to learn how hitting the ball on a different spot on the ball changes the relationship between spin and pace, then you're going to be able to make more of these short balls. So for instance, a lot of times I see players who have this ball right here into the court, short in the court, and they're trying to brush up. And as a result, they just hit like a spinny shot. It doesn't drive through the court. It just sits up and their opponent passes them every time. Or they're hitting the ball up and they're hitting that ball long because again, they're not hitting the ball at the right trajectory. So you have to make sure when you're in the court more to change your swing path so that it's more flat and as you do that if you contact that even again at a 45 degree angle that ball is going to dive down but now the harder you hit it you're going to be able to penetrate the court more and so you can hit this ball harder and that's going to give you a nice shot that's going to drive into the court with lots of spin so make sure you understand now that where you are in the court is going to change how that contact occurs and what angle your face is going to be in relation to the center of mass on the ball. So now you better understand how striking the ball in relationship to its center of mass is going to cause the ball to rotate. And so creating topspin on your shot is a matter of the racket's face in relationship to its swing path and how that face is contacting the ball either on its center of mass or off its center of mass. And so just trying to have this like somewhat closed or neutral face at contact really is insignificant because that's not what's going to determine how much topspin your shot really has. And it's really not a good way to gauge how to hit topspin because depending on where the ball is on the court, you may need more or less topspin and your swing path may change. So if you're always trying to have that face, you may not be hitting the ball in the correct spot. So you need to understand how your swing path with the face angle is striking the ball in relation to its center of mass. And once you start to understand and master that, you're going to be able to hit the ball with more pace and more spin and hit it where you want it to go. Thanks for watching this video. If you have any questions, be sure to hit us in the comments below. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the Hammer Tennis channel. That way you'll be sure to get everything on Hammer Tennis.